Today we are looking at Kawhi's CA901. This is the flagship model from their CA series. They've got some new speaker setups here that we're going to investigate, new sample setups, lots to listen to and talk about. So let's get started with this right away. Kawhi had a tall order in front of them to outdo themselves after the release of the CA99. That was a fantastic piano. I think everybody was really super impressed with the speaker system, uh, the action, how the action was mated uh, to the new sort of second generation uh, SKEX uh, rendering engine. Everything about it was really great. So I was curious to see whether they were going to be able to outdo themselves with the CA901. So here are my first impressions before we get to uh, all of the nuts and bolts of the instrument. I'm an owner of a Kawhi Novus 5. Uh, some of you who are regular watchers of the channel will probably already be aware of that. Uh, there is still an action gap between the Novus 5 and the CA99. Novus 5 uses essentially a full upright action, uh, kind of with a similar geometry to like a K200 acoustic piano. Whereas the CA99 is using uh, the Grand Feel 3. So even though the key stick length and the pivot lengths are fairly similar, the mechanism on the other side of it is quite a bit different. But here is where the gap is really starting to close, which is the speaker performance and generally speaking the overall acoustic experience of playing this piano versus say playing something like the Novus 5. That gap is getting narrower and narrower and there is lots to like about what the speakers are doing on this instrument. We are gonna start with the action. Action is critical. It is on every digital piano because that is the interface between yourself and uh, the tone, just as it is on an acoustic piano. It's literally the mechanical uh, piece that you control uh, that, that, that gets the sound out of the instrument. And so how you uh, connect with it um, and, and how it's balanced against the tone that's generated is really, really important. It's the difference between feeling like you're really inside the music or feeling like you're fighting this machine the whole time. So I've mentioned the pivot length. This is one of the really big things about the Grand Feel 3 and generally speaking the whole Grand Feel series of actions from Kawhi, uh, which is that when you've got a key that's the same length approximately as an acoustic piano, uh, uh, you're, you've got a key that's very easy to control regardless of where you are playing uh, in the note and the resistance is fairly consistent regardless of where you are playing in the note. The longer the lever, uh, the less proportionally speaking uh, this section represents as a percentage of the total lever. Uh, so you're going to get less of a difference. Um, I.e., if you're playing, you know, a key here, it's going to still feel fairly similar to how you're playing it there. Even right at the back, you know, you're feeling a bit of a difference, but it's still highly controllable. Whereas when you've got digital pianos where that pivot length is much shorter, there's a massive difference in the resistance and controllability of the key, depending on whether you play it here, here, or here. Um, where that may not affect beginning players that much, as you become more of an advanced player and the repertoire becomes a little more advanced, you actually find that you're using a really big percentage of the overall real estate on the key to play uh, different chords, different voicings, different passages. Uh, if you look at the overhead shot, You can see that uh, you know my fingers are, especially on some of the black keys, fairly in. So this is this is not an academic kind of hypothetical benefit. It's it's actually quite real. The second thing is is just like the CA99 and the 79 and the 701, which is its current uh, counterpart, that Grandfield 3, um, the whole key bed and the way that the key uh, sits in that key bed is also very reminiscent of what happens in an acoustic piano. You don't have hinges per se, you don't have springs. Um, it is a key that's basically sitting on steel pins and it's rocking back and forth. It's cushioned with real felt and it's sitting on real wood. This is a structure or a mechanical design that has been around for 150 plus years 
at, or even longer, I guess, in terms of that portion of the action. And it's super durable. It requires very little to no maintenance. Uh, and you can um, put a lot of physical abuse uh, into this keyboard without it needing uh, to be serviced. Uh, and some of those drawbacks that plastic actions have, which is that back hinge starts to loosen up over time and, and cause some clicking, completely absent on something like the Grand Feel 3. In terms of weight, The way that they've done the touch curve on this makes the key actually feel a little on the light side. Um, this is of course just uh, kind of a psychoacoustic effect um, because if you turn the volume completely off, the keys never change uh, feel. So it's always what you think you're getting back out of the instrument compared to what you're putting in which uh, produces your overall uh, impression of the weight of the key. But in this case, the way it's uh, set up right off the shelf, it produces a sense that it's a little on the light side. Um, and if they're using the same touch curve as they've used on the Novus 5, then this is totally understandable because the physical action on the Novus 5 is a little bit heavier than this. And so um, to me, uh, that instrument has like a perfect mating between the touch curve and the actual weight of the key and, and your output. So if I was going to be using this, I would go in and maybe just uh, tweak the touch curve slightly to the heavy side. Uh, in terms of the key surface, we've got a textured black key and a matte textured white key. A lot of manufacturers are putting this faux ebony texture on the black key these days. Um, for me, that's not really like a pro or a con. Uh, generally, what you need to know is anytime you're adding texture to a key surface, the more dramatic the texture, the more slippery it's going to be because you're actually reducing uh, the uh, surface area that your finger is in contact with. So that's a personal thing. This action has escapement or let off simulation. What I like about let off, and I've said this in multiple videos, when you're playing in a very, very soft situation, that results in better control. Kind of makes it a little easier to voice those, you know, piano, mezzo piano chords, uh, bring a nice melody note out on top. And a fun fact that many people probably don't really think about is all of these actions are hand assembled. One last quick point, this is a triple sensor of course, so the accuracy of the output on this action is excellent if you're gonna be using this for recording either as a direct sound source or as a MIDI source, you are gonna be very, very, very happy and pleased with the accuracy and the, and the dynamic range of the MIDI information that this is going to be uh, outputting. So let's now move on from action into the piano tone because that is definitely a centerpiece of this instrument and generally speaking, this whole series of pianos. Now what they have loaded onto the 901 as well as the 701, we've done another review of the 701 very, very recently, uh, is they've um, added this new sample set called the SKEX Competition. What is this? Well, in short, there are two generations of Shigeru Kawai acoustic pianos. And this gets a little bit nerdy, uh, but this is, this is exactly why they've got this, uh, this new sample set. Uh, when the Shigeru first came out, they had the SKEX, and it was using a fairly similar uh, rim construction uh, to what they had been using on like the RX Grands. There wasn't um, hard rock maple content in that rim. Uh, so it had a bit more of a European tone to it. Um, it was a very warm tone at a very sweet bell-like tone. At, at moments, the treble had kind of a Bissendorfer uh, type of a sound to it. Um, and the mid-range was very warm and it had a nice barky bass. The next generation of the Shigeru, which they called the uh, SKL series um, or concert series, not sure why the L was there. 
ah, could be because they lengthened the key sticks. Um, so they had a longer uh, key stick, but more critically, they changed uh, the whole cabinetry of the instrument uh, and a little bit of how they were uh, sculpting the soundboard and the tone had a quite, quite a different uh, character to it. So they've now captured this in digital form because up until this point, every digital piano Kawhi's produced has actually been reproducing the original SKEX, not the more recent version. And so now there's a bit more of an American, kind of a New York Steinway-esque mid-range tone to the instrument. Um, but a much cleaner, more colorful treble than I usually get um, out of a Steinway without getting into those uncontrolled uh, sort of um, secondary harmonics that, that New Yorks are so famous for. Uh, and so this is what you now get is this SKEX competition. And I want to compare that to the original SKEX because, of course, it's on there. Here's the original uh, EX. Competition. Original. Back to competition. So I haven't done a spectral analysis, but I know that it's either like the third partial, fourth partial, something in that range in the competition is a lot beefier on the attack of that note. And so there's just this broadness that you're getting. And the higher up on the piano you play, the more obvious it is. I don't actually notice that big a difference in terms of how the bass is behaving, but if you do play a lot of music where the melodic content uh, is more in the top range, or if you're playing a lot of like late romantic classical, uh, where you have you know these bombastic kind of parts up at top with Rachmaninoff or Prokofiev or even some Chopin stuff, you're going to notice a big difference with that. So. I love the fact that this is on here because it really is quite reminiscent of the real second generation uh, Shigeru Kawai, which, uh, as we've been saying uh, all through the video, is what this is modeled after. For people who are completely new to this most recent CA series, this uses a rendering engine, and this is again just sort of branded fancy language. What does that mean? Well, basically, they've recorded this instrument with multiple microphones in various positions. They've uh, basically produced several preset mixes of all of those um, microphone positions, and they've given it to you uh, in uh, this rendering engine, and you can go in and you can select it. And they've given them various names. So Rich, you're, put, you're grabbing a little bit more of uh, kind of the duplex string area of the instrument. Romantic um, is almost entirely from a kind of side cabinet. Uh, you know, you've got Brilliant, you've got Classic. So this is what all of those rendering engines are doing. It's different mix downs of, of multiple mic positions into a stereo signal that you're now hearing through your headphones or, or through the speakers. Now, in addition to that customizability that it's giving you, you then also have resonance engines, which are um, kind of adding to the, the various permutations of harmonics that you can produce. Because of course, all the very best sampling engines will only ever give you, you know, one note being played at once. 
all of those additional harmonics that happen when you play notes in combination need to be generated in real time because there's just no way to sample all the various permutations. We're talking about millions and millions of samples you'd need. Just unrealistic. The SKEX rendering has four different uh, resonance engines on it to add like string resonance and damper resonance and things like that. And then beyond the resonance engines, you've got what they used to call the virtual technician, which gives you another 19 or 20 parameters. Uh, so in terms of the customizability or editability of a piano tone, it's my impression that Kawhi is giving you the maximum range of that uh, in terms of an onboard sound engine. When we get into VSTs, then you know it's very hard to compete against VSTs and all the permutations you can get out of that, especially if you're talking about engines such as Piano Tech uh, uh, or the Vienna Symphonic Libraries or something like that. Now those first two SKEX are the only ones that have that rendering engine or the multi-dimensional recording uh, where you're getting those various mix downs. Um, but it's not the only stereo sample set that are on here. You've also got a EX Concert Grand Piano, which is sort of a brighter sound. You've got an SK5, which is a six foot seven. I really like it's it's obvious it's been captured in sort of a smaller tighter space lovely um, and then a k60 upright I'm so glad that manufacturers are now capturing upright pianos um, as though it matters. Because the attack on an upright piano is so specific in terms of how you hear it as a player. And that's the core of the acoustic piano tones you get on this instrument. I would think for most people who are gonna be playing this piano, you're gonna be spending 90% of your time within those tones. If you're not, which is totally fine, you are kind of missing uh, where the biggest technology uh, investments have gone into this instrument, uh, which is of course, piano engine. So the speaker system on the CA901 is for sure a discussion point. I already thought the 99 uh, was, was well done, but as I said in the very opening segment of this, I think the gap that's truly closed here between it and say the flagship Novus 5, if we're talking about a kind of upright console pianos, is the speaker system. So a few things that are different now. We have got um, four speakers uh, up in, in the front here, um, and they're now newly baffled, uh, so that you are getting a lot of those highs rather than being dispersed into the rest of the room. Uh, the highs are, are properly now uh, coming towards your ear, as well as some of the mid-tones. And what this properly simulates is, of course, when you're playing on an upright piano and you've got the lid open a little bit, um, all of that tone isn't being directed into the room, it's being directed toward your ears. So now that you've got some directional baffling happening 
happening with your tweeters uh, and your mids, this is feeling way more connected than it was before, which is probably the reason I'm feeling like I need to go in and back off the touch curve a little bit because it's just, it's so clean and so full of detail. I'm just not used to it. Not necessarily a bad thing, but I like having to like really push the instrument a little bit more before I get that much detail out. Small little edit to make, but it would be totally worth it um, because now you've got this crazy level of color and detail coming out of your front, uh, or your top speakers rather. You've also got two speakers along the front to simulate exactly what would be happening on an upright piano in terms of pushing piano out the bottom board. And there's actually a gap right below um, kind of your center line of where your strings are resonating. There's a lot of sound that's actually escaping out of that uh, little tone port on a real upright piano that you'd never even notice because often you don't see it, it's out of sight. We've got speakers there to simulate that. And then on the back, of course, the showpiece of the CA901 is the fact that it's got a real soundboard. Uh, this is not just kind of a piece of uh, like MDF that's been veneered. This is real spruce and it's being driven by two transducers which have been reconfigured from the original CA99, 98, 97 series that have always had the soundboards. What has this reconfiguration done? Well, to me, there's a couple of things that I notice. Uh, there's a few woofy points on the CA99 where if you really push the volume on certain patches, um, you get a little bit of, uh, yeah, woof is about the best word to describe it. Also, when you get right into the bottom end, you lose a little bit of clarity on that uh, soundboard uh, when you're really up in your top volumes. The 901, it sounds tighter, and I haven't been able to get any kind of unwanted resonance areas on any of the patches that I've been playing. You've got a dual uh, DAC system, uh, which is different and new from the CA99. This is an upgrade they were forced to do uh, because Ankyo went out of business, then they had to do uh, some redesigning of their main board. And the cleanliness, particularly uh, on the transients and your trebles, are so clean. I mean, you just can't hear any uh, breakup or artifacting uh, going on in the tone at all. Accompanying that, and they've always had this, uh, but again, I think the spatialization that goes along with this is now improved, is the headphone amplifier. So it's a discrete headphone amplifier, and you can get in there and really play with the, with the spatialization. Particularly when you're using the rendering engine, this is so cool uh, because if you're using a set of headphones which is of good quality, your ear is picking up on all of this three-dimensional detail uh, that's there and it's so fun. So make sure you've got a pretty decent set of headphones, like not the $40, $50 stuff, get something that's, that's a little bit, treat yourself. Not that this isn't treating yourself, but just go like the extra one or 2% um, and get a set of headphones that's gonna give you that detail. So let's cover some of the other features and connectivity options that this instrument has. Uh, just like the 701, the 901, and before it, the CA99, uh, this has got a dual mode, uh, meaning you can split the instrument and have two sets of keys in the same range. Great for teachers, by the way, they love this feature. Uh, you can layer two sounds together, and you can split the instrument uh, as well into two separate sounds. So this has been with us for a long time. These are kind of standard digital piano features at this point, but always worth noting because sometimes people are watching these videos and just coming into the digital piano world for the very first time. We, we can't forget that. Also, there is a metronome function where you can choose a variety of beats and beat settings. Uh, as well as drum rhythms. This has Bluetooth audio as well as MIDI. The Bluetooth MIDI allows you to connect this to mobile devices, uh, both to interface directly with the Kawai app that, it, that uh, it comes with for free, as well as a whole bunch of other apps that are Bluetooth MIDI compliant, such as uh, GarageBand uh, for mobile. There's, there's several others, a lot of learning apps that are um, MIDI mobile compliant. Uh, tons of stuff where you can get a lot of value out of that uh, wireless uh, MIDI connection. This will connect uh, directly to a computer with a USB cable as well uh, if you want to be transmitting uh, MIDI information uh, to like a laptop or a PC. It also has a 3.5 mil audio input with gain control. So if you don't want to be using Bluetooth audio for whatever reason, you can actually have a wired connection where some sort of an audio source uh, is plugged in. Wouldn't recommend that that be a microphone, although it probably technically would work. I think it's a little more designed kind of for line level sources. Not many companies make a big deal about the pedal or talking about the pedal. Kawhi is focused on this for the last couple of years and it's subtle, 
you know, it's not like the end of the world if these things weren't there, but when you really pay attention to it, it's kind of nice that they are. They've been taking approach for the last several CA models where the three pedals, the tension of those three pedals are matched to that of a real grand piano, which means that your middle pedal is actually pretty lightweight, just like it is on a grand. That's uh, normally uh, your sostenuto. Then you've got your right pedal, which is your damper pedal, which is kind of a medium weight. And then your left pedal, uh, which is your una corda pedal, uh, which actually tends to, usually on a, on a piano, be your heaviest. So you've got three slightly different uh, spring tensions on that, but they've also improved and increase the travel distance on the pedal uh, for both the 701 and the 901 so that it feels um, even closer to that of a real piano. And you do notice it, particularly for people who are transitioning from an acoustic down to a digital, and there are plenty of those. So lots of uh, people who are either on their own or couples who are downsizing, moving out of the family home after several decades, moving into condo life or a smaller uh, home for the first time, and they're looking for an instrument that's going to make them feel as musically fulfilled as possible with as few compromises, you know, the pedal is actually something you don't think about, but you definitely notice it when they pay attention. So down to our last couple sections, I do want to cover the user interface because the CA series takes such a novel approach to this. It's basically like using a smartphone or like an Android uh, tablet, little mini tablet embedded right in the instrument. Um, the other cool thing is when you use the companion app to control this from an iOS device or an Android device, it's exactly the same program as it's embedded in the control device on here. So there's no difference in how you would navigate it, whether you want to use it from the side panel or whether you're going to want to use it from your, uh, from your phone. So either way, you're basically getting a snapshot of what it would look like uh, when we're going to explore it right now. So there are three navigational areas uh, to be aware of to access all of your musical uh, features on here, and it's right along the bottom. So you've got your piano area, your sounds, which brings up all of your other areas, um, and then uh, your music, which includes the ability to access lesson books, uh, composer, USB media player. Uh, so let's take a look at the piano section. You'll see where it's got SKEX Competition Grand up front. Uh, if you want to edit uh, what's going on with that piano, you're actually going to press the up button here, and this is where you're going to get your editing menu. So right up top in the rendering, and this only appears with your SKEX and SKEX Competition, this is where you're selecting these various mix downs of your multi-dimensional recordings. So classic is the default, then you've got brilliant, romantic, and I'll just quickly play for you what these are sounding like as we're going through. So this is classic, brilliant, romantic, Rich, which is kind of a favorite of mine. Vintage. Concert. Jazz. And mellow. So that is how you're selecting essentially your tonal source. Then you're down into your various uh, presets for your, uh, they call it virtual piano artisan, AKA virtual technician. And this is where it's going to be affecting things like key noise, damper noise, um, you know, lid open, lid closed, pedal noise, um, all those different, I think 19 different parameters that you can affect. So these are presets uh, rather than having to edit those all individually. So soft, light resonance,
historical. But if you find one, it's like, oh, that's almost, but I'd love to get in there and play even more. Edit. Now you're adjusting everything one by one. So this is where your touch curve would be, your voicing, uh, your string resonances, your damper noise, undampened string resonance, cabinet resonance, hammer delay, top board, decay time. There's a lot of stuff in here. Finally, you've got your ambience, your tuning, and your transpose. And you can save that preset down in your bottom right corner. User sound name, you can assign that a name, and then it's saved. You never have to edit that again. Super handy. Um, for navigating through the different pianos in here, this one I had to figure out. Um, swiping um, can be a little bit inaccurate because it's very easy to skip sounds. Um, but if you just tap to the right or to the left, then it's super accurate. You're always going to just move one over. Easy to do. And there's your upright piano. So that's essentially all you need to know to navigate through your main piano section. Sounds is a completely different environment. Um, and they've done it in two ways. They've got these categories up top, recently played, recommended, concert, jazz, pop which, you know, I personally have not found to be like super helpful, but some people may find that to be an interesting way to navigate the instrument. Um, more useful is using the categories down the left side, and those are done by these little icons. Uh, so you've got your grand piano tones, then you've got your electric piano sounds, Then you've got your organ, your electric organ. Keep forgetting to select. And then church organ, and I mentioned this on the 701. Uh, there's a huge selection of really well sampled uh, authentic pipe organ tones uh, that are loaded on the 701 and 901. So you've got you know, church organ, diapason, full ensemble. So on. Uh, you've got harpsichords, then you've got mallet instruments, uh, you've got stringed instruments, uh, choir and pad, electronic pad, bass, uh, and guitar. And those are all navigable um, by your left icon. And then, as we said, we've got music. So you can uh, play a whole bunch of preloaded uh, music sorted by composer. So you can go through there. And then there are further settings, which allows you to get into your speaker uh, headphone, so your con tone control, essentially your EQ, your low volume balance, if you are gonna be playing in a lower volume, I don't recommend that, but they've made accommodations for that, your speaker volume, your speaker character. There's some shaping going on if you, uh, if you want, and then you've got wall EQ, if you're gonna have it pushed up right against a wall, it trims off some um, of the highs and certain frequency ranges that tend to slap back a little more harshly when you've got it up against the wall. And then you've got your spatialized headphone options, headphone type, and your headphone volume. So that's all within uh, your settings menu. Your forehand mode if you want that, Bluetooth settings, independent Bluetooth volume, which is actually really handy and sometimes not present on certain uh, digital pianos, your user data, and finally, you can get into your system for things like auto power off, your startup screen. So 
Very easy to navigate. I think they've done a really nice job of cleaning up this interface to be probably one of the most intuitive and user-friendly interfaces of any digital piano on the market. So there's a quick guide through the user interface. We're gonna finish this off with a demo-driven playing sample of the speakers so that we can get uh, the uh, microphones right where my ears would be to try and give you the very best impression of exactly what I would be hearing as a player in front of this instrument. Thanks so much for watching everybody. This has been our look at the CA901, quite the sonic experience behind this instrument. Hope you enjoy it as much as I have if you get a chance. My name is Stu Harrison. This has been Miriam Pianos on YouTube. We'll see you again soon.